Grace, mercy, and peace are yours through God our Savior, through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. At first glance, it may seem that the events of our gospel from Luke chapter 14 seem more than just a little disconnected from life in 21st century America. Yes, Jesus dared to heal a man on the Sabbath, but the impact of this might be lost on us who probably have never spent a minute wondering if the work we're about to do on a Saturday is sanctioned by God. And then, of course, you have Jesus scolding the dinner guests because they were all jockeying for the best places at the table, all trying to receive those seats of honor, the seats closest to the host. And just imagine what, what someone might react if you were to tell them the sermon today was about which seats we should take when we get invited over to someone's house for dinner. But if we bother to look a little closer and to go with Jesus along to this dinner invitation, we see that he has much more to teach than just Sabbath day rules and dinner etiquette. In fact, the first thing we may see is that the invitation itself seems more than just a little suspicious. You're all well aware that, that the Jewish religious leaders, those called the Pharisees, were no friends of Jesus. And it seems that from the very first day of Jesus' teaching, they were his greatest critics. So did this Pharisee, a prominent Pharisee, a leader of the Pharisees, have a change of heart when he invited Jesus over for a meal that Saturday afternoon? It, it seems unlikely, doesn't it? And our suspicion may well be confirmed when we see as Jesus entered the home of this Pharisee, all of the guests raising their heads and their eyes being fixed on Jesus, watching him closely like a cat might watch a mouse waiting for the chance to pounce. And perhaps it seemed that that chance came when a man who was ill was presented before Jesus. And all of these Pharisees and these experts in the Jewish law knew that, that the Sabbath day meant that there was no work allowed. And in fact, they had very detailed rules as to what counted or didn't count as work. And yet Jesus questioned to them, it seemed very straightforward. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And for men who certainly could spend a lot of time talking about what was lawful and what wasn't, it's remarkable that none of them had anything to say. And so Jesus responded with action as he took hold of this man and healed him and sent him on his way. And then he raised another question for these guests, these Pharisees and Jewish religious lawyers. If one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? And Jesus, of course, is setting them up for the answer, yes, of course we would do that. And still no one said a word. And their silence really spoke volumes, doesn't it? Because each of those men knew that if they had a son or they had a prized animal who had fallen into a well on the Sabbath day and were at risk of losing their life, they would jump into saving action. In that moment, the law of love is much greater than any Sabbath day regulation. So why did they all stand there with their mouths shut? Why did they all keep this, this response, which is obvious to all of us, private? Uh, could it be that they were afraid of what the others would think? Afraid of looking weak in front of their peers? Afraid of upsetting the host himself by siding with Jesus on this point? Could it be that the Pharisees were really no different than the rest of us? <clears throat> In that we all want to be accepted. We all want 
to belong. We all want the praise of others. And for these Pharisees, who of course devoted their lives to the the study of God and His Word and to the traditions of the Jewish elders passed down to them, they believed in their heart of hearts that the way to please God was to live in outward obedience to all of these laws. And if you would have asked them, what what is the purpose of your life? What is your mission statement, so to speak? They would have told you, I live to please God, to serve God. But if you would have examined their lives and how they lived each and every day, it was clear they lived to please each other. Uh, to please those other men who who shared their similar beliefs, those men part of their group who they looked up to. They lived to be justified in the eyes of men. They lived to look good and receive the praise of those who were like them. And though they might have said, we live to serve God, the God they served was the God of the acceptance of my peers. And doesn't that explain then what happened when Jesus watched, as Jesus watched all of the guests trying to gain those seats of honor at the table? Doesn't that explain it? If you live to please those who are part of your group and to win honor among men, well then you take every opportunity you can to rise in the ranks of your group. And if you can't be a prominent Pharisee, well, the next best best thing is to be close to one and to receive the honor that would come from being related closely to that person. Now, before any of us would, would think that we are far above ever trying to jockey for the best seats at the table, Just ask yourself this question. Who do you try to please? Or or which group is it or which peer circle is it that, that you're hoping to be a part of, to belong to, even if it means doing things that are not pleasing to your God? Let me give you an example. Maybe you remember back when you were in school, if you're not in school right now, maybe you remember a time when someone came to you asking if they could copy your paper. And that person was someone you looked up to, someone you hoped to be make a friend of because they were part of that group that you wanted to be part of. And so you let them cheat, doing something unpleasing to God so that you could win the favor or the acceptance of a peer. Of course, the examples go far beyond that. Who is it that that you are hoping to please, hoping to win the praise of, even if it means going against or doing things that are unpleasing to God? Could it be people at your work or your boss or the boys at school who only pay attention to girls who act or dress a certain way? Could it be your grown children who have, who have distanced themselves from the faith and you're worried about, about losing something in that relationship. Could it be that, that someone might come to church hoping to win the praise of men or the praise of the pastor and thinking that if people at church think I'm a good Christian, well, that must mean that God too thinks I'm okay. Yes, the the thoughts and the actions of those Pharisees are not so foreign to us as we might like to think. Have you ever stood there silent because you were afraid to side with Jesus and lose status among your friends or your family? Have you ever pushed someone over with your words to win a laugh? to win the praise of that most prominent person in your circle of friends. 
There's a, a common theme among all of this, whether you're the Pharisee looking for the praise and acceptance of other Pharisees so that you might justify yourself before men, or if you're the high school freshman just hoping to fit in with the circle of friends. The way to acceptance, the way to praise seems to be this, promote yourself. Promote yourself, and that's how you get acceptance in this world. Jesus calls it exalting oneself. Putting yourself first is the way to win praise. Jesus was not just warning about the problems or the downfalls of of exalting oneself in this world. He was not just giving those dinner guests some suggestions for dinner etiquette to avoid that awkward situation when you're asked to move from the high seat down to the lowest seat by the host. He was teaching them a spiritual truth. Call it kingdom etiquette. That God in His kingdom turns that little formula upside down. The way to acceptance, the way to belonging is not to promote yourself, but to humble yourself. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. If you're looking for acceptance... If you're looking for a permanent sense of belonging, do not look to your peers or to your family or to your circles of friends or your co-workers at work. Look only to God. Just think about it. If you could win the praise of this whole world and the acceptance of everyone, and yet on that last day you are rejected and humbled by God, what have you gained? What have you gained, even if after you're gone, the world continues praising your name? What have you gained? The truth is, our natural desire for acceptance, that part of us that that wants to belong, it's our soul's desire for home. A place of, of permanent belonging. And Jesus says that if if you want to find this, this kind of acceptance and this kind of belonging, well, then you must empty yourself and confess before God that you have nothing that would please Him, nothing that would win His favor. This is what Jesus means when He says that we must humble ourselves. This is what humility looks like. And then know that that God has extended to you an invitation to come home. And the etiquette in Jesus' kingdom, the etiquette in this home is simply this, humble yourselves and God will exalt you, not because of anything found in you, but because of Jesus. In Jesus, you are accepted. In Jesus, you belong. And yes, He knows all the sins of your youth. He knows the insecurities that keep you awake at night, even now. And don't misunderstand me. Sometimes Christians are quoted as saying things like, God accepts you just the way you are. He doesn't. He cannot accept you with your sin and the baggage of that sin. And so God sends His Son who empties Himself of all the glory that is his, his and all the honor that belongs to him, Jesus humbles himself so that he can carry our sin and all the sins of our efforts to win the praise of people, even if that means compromising our faith. So that he could offer to his Father the perfect sacrifice, the acceptable sacrifice on his cross. And that God himself might exalt Jesus and raise him from the dead And promise that all who look to Him, all who trust in Him, find life in Him, forgiveness in Him. And what could be a higher calling? What could be a bigger sense of belonging than to be called a child of God? What greater honor is this than to be invited to take part in the meal that Jesus 
himself invites you to. And what words are spoken to you in this world that are more remarkable than the words that will be spoken to you today as you receive the supper for you? Words that drive away all doubt of whether or not you belong. This, of course, is, is really the secret, the secret of living as a Christian in this world. Knowing that, that you no longer have to search for this sense of belonging because you belong in Jesus. Knowing that you don't have to worry about the acceptance of this world because God has already accepted you in Jesus. And this then sets you free. It sets you free from that lifelong effort of promoting yourself in hope of finding something from your peers or your circle of friends, some praise or some sense of belonging that will only fade with time. It sets you free to no longer search for honor in this world, but to give yourself wholly in service to others. It sets you free because God has turned that formula upside down. And what more could the world offer than, you, than what you already have in Him? This is the invitation that God has extended to you. This is what Jesus means when he teaches us his kingdom etiquette. Humble yourself because God has exalted you in Christ. Amen.